you're you're being recorded now. I, I turn off the camera, so it's just a screen share that's being recorded. Um, so everything that I do that's that's on the screen will get captured in the recording, and any audio will get captured on the recording. Um, but no no video of the classroom, so you don't need to worry about anything like that. Uh, but if you do, I don't know. This is not to prevent you from speaking up. Just be aware if you do speak up and ask questions, you will be on the recording. Um, I don't bother you back and cut out people's voices or anything like that unless there's a big. I guess if somebody felt really strongly about their privacy and wanted me to do that, then we could have a discussion. Come talk to me about that. Um, I'm not adverse to that. I just it's extra extra work, extra clicks that nobody feels that strongly about their voice being on camera. Then um, I probably won't go to that trouble. Um, and I think everybody in here was there's nobody here that wasn't in lab today or yesterday, so everybody knows who I am. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about me when we get started here. Um, but first, I wanted to start by just walking through where stuff's going to be on Canvas, because my Canvas setup is a little bit different than Carl's. Um, so if you just click on the, the Gen Chem link in student view, um, usually what will happen is any announcements that I make, I will use the announcement feature. I think I did a few times in your class last quarter when I had to cancel my office hours or things like that. Um, I use announcements to communicate with the whole class. I won't send out class-wide emails. It'll all come through Canvas. So you probably want to have your notifications turned on um, for, for that or have it forwarding stuff to your um, to your email or whatever email, however you keep in touch with the world, with the, with the internet. Um, just get it set up so that it's going to give you all the, um, all the notifications that you desire so you're not fat and cold that way. Um, and then below that is basically, I just kind of do a week by week schedule. Um, I'll typically, you know, Monday or Tuesday when I get around to, when I get around to creating things for the, from the weekends, um, I'll go in and I'll change the HTML so that the red, whatever our current week is will be red usually. So you'll know, you know, you won't have to keep track of what, what week is what. Um, but all you have to do is to find the bulk of the stuff, the most important stuff. Is going to be look over on your to do, um, which is where all your assignments are going to show up, as I'm sure everybody's familiar with at this point. Um, and then um, in the week one tab, it's going to have PDF link to my slides for each for each day, as well as what after the lecture. Um, I just use Zoom to to record the lectures because it's give, had the best results for me in the past as far as being consistent with the quality, regardless of the internet on campus. Um, I tried live streaming or streaming straight to YouTube and capturing it that way, but YouTube was a little bit more finicky with the connection. Um, so it's it's kind of a fast awkward way of doing things, but I use Zoom to capture the screen that gets get recorded that I then download and then re-upload to YouTube and then I'll post the link to the YouTube because everybody knows YouTube and YouTube is the best for video playback even if their streaming doesn't work well for our system here. So I'm open, obviously, to new ideas. If anybody has a better workaround for me, feel free to let me know. Um, I'm not a professional videographer or anything, so I don't have the best ways of doing that. But then, so if you click on here, it'll bring you the way you can download these if you want. Like I was mentioning um, before class, I try to get these posted about 20 minutes before class starts. Um, some people have really good luck, to, you know, waiting for me to post them and then go to the library and print them out. You can take your notes directly on the slides or just have a laptop open, have the slides up, take notes. There's a lot of ways you can use that, but this is going to be the bulk of the information that we go through as I'm going to post as the slides pulled mostly out of the OpenStax textbook. Um, and then, you know, and there's no guarantees I won't go back and change stuff about these slides too. Um, but in general, that's the best way to, to get to them. And then after I go through my convoluted process and get everything posted to YouTube and rendered and everything, then I'll post the link um, right here, of course, is lecture video. So if you miss any lectures, don't fret. No big deal because everything's captured here. All my board work will be captured. Anything that I do on the whiteboard side obviously won't get captured. That can, I try to use just the smart board as much as possible so that all that shows up in the recording. So you have access to the whole lecture after the fact as well. So in other words, you don't need to worry too much about taking perfect notes because you've got the slides 
So no frantically scribbling down everything that's written on screen um, because you have it in front of you and you'll have a recording after the fact as well. Um, I've had pretty good results with students seem to like that. That way you can be present and paying attention, asking questions and less focused on how do I write everything down as fast as possible because you'll always have the recording to go back to. Um, again, open to new ideas as well. So if you can think anything from other classes that's worked really well that you think I should incorporate, please let me know. Um, and then usually I'll also post assignments that are either assigned or due during this week. I'm kind of bad about remembering to update those though. Um, so from the Canvas homepage, um, in that to-do list off on the side, I, I'm good about due dates. In the Canvas assignments, I just might forget to put the links in the week in the week to week overview. So if you're paying attention over here to your due dates and what's on your to do list and things like that, you won't miss anything. Even if I forget to upload, upload it in the week one top or whatever. Um, any let's see what else is on here. Uh, I do have a PDF of my weekly schedule. It's also posted outside my office. Um, if you need to meet with me on Zoom, here's my, it's got my Zoom link. Uh, if, you want, if you're not on campus, but you want to do office hours, um, we're talking about something that's easier to do that way than it is on uh, via email. Also email me if you have any questions, anything like that. Um, a couple, so our syllabus link here, I think some of you found an old syllabus. I think it's some, since been updated. Nope, that does not look like the right one since it still says 2019. So I'll get that updated too. This still has our room numbers and everything as well. Um, so I'll fix that later today. Um, incidentally, so this probably doesn't matter as much to, to you all, but um, it's been five years since I taught this class, which means all of my dates are actually don't need to be changed. <laughs> which what our first year in that 2019 was, was whatever month it is. Um, April 9th of 2019. So with the leap year and all the year and everything else, we're back where we started. So I didn't have to adjust, adjust any dates, which was fun for me. That's usually really obnoxious part of our dating and civil this is just going back. Everything shifts by two days this year and going back and changing them all by hand. So I didn't have to do that, um, which was nice. I also didn't update the syllabus though. So just Juneteenth. Yeah, Juneteenth is in there this year too. So that'll be nice. An extra holiday and get to celebrate some some good history. Um, so the as far as the resources on here go, most of what you're going to care about is the periodic tables and conversion sheets. These are going to be the same ones that I put on the in class tests. Um, we'll talk about tests and how that all works. But basically, here you'll have access to the same periodic table and the same equation sheet that are going to be printed with your final with your midterm. I'm going to give you a fresh copy every time so you don't have notes on your periodic table that you get to bring into the tests, but it'll be everything will look the exact same as far as what's printed. So uh, as far especially with the equation sheet, that's really helpful to be able to know, like, oh, I don't remember where I have never seen this equation sheet before. Where is Planck's constant or something like that? It's going to be the same one that you're dealing with the entire quarter. So I'll get used to using it. Then you'll know exactly where everything is when you get to the test and you're not gonna panic and forget where something is and you've been using it for six weeks like that. Um, all of should look pretty similar to what you've seen before. I believe it's the same equation sheet probably that, that Carl was using. Um, other periodic tables, other random stuff. Other stuff in, in that. I also cut out the appendices. These might be for the uh, first edition. So you have PDFs just of the appendices, which matters a lot for 102 and 103, looking up those H values and stuff like that. They all have their own PDF now, so that slows them, help you out with things, um, potentially. Hopefully you find it useful because it's it's not a huge pain in the butt to do, but it's, you know, a little bit better. Um, and then just random cool stuff. Um, Feel free to click around and see if there's some interesting things in there. Uh, anyway, any questions on Canvas? How things are run on Canvas? How to, does everybody have a way to turn stuff in on Canvas? Seems like I'll always accept stuff on paper, but it works better for everybody if you do it on Canvas because then one, I can't lose it. 
you get to keep your copy to study from it if you want to. Otherwise, you're relying on me finishing grading something and handing it back to you, which would be a really long wait. Um, so I always prefer for things to get turned in on Canvas for the timestamp for all those other reasons. So, but if you're done with it on paper and I'm sitting right in front of you and you want to turn it on paper, I'm not going to say no. Um, I just highly recommend the Canvas route if you have the ability. All right, Canvas questions. Awesome, then we'll get to actual slides here. I always forget to do the walk Canvas walkthrough, like, oh, here's where you find everything. And then, you know, a week from now, everybody's trying to find the video recordings and I get all sorts of panicked emails. Um, so I thought I would start with that. Um, I'm also, this is actually gonna be one of the first times I've taken over for somebody else in the middle of the series. I've handed off the series to other people um, several times, but I'm not usually the one who comes in in the middle of the series to finish out 103. Um, so that's a little bit different to me. So we'll start with doing some syllabus stuff, stuff that I'm normally in 103 I would ignore because you've had me for two quarters by now. Um, that's not the case. So we'll do a little bit of syllabus day stuff, talk about um, my teaching and learning philosophy, and then we'll get into some review and some stuff that I'm not that I don't think you quite got to but it's all just gonna be equilibrium today. Um, so if you could do KA and KB, if you can do basic equilibrium stuff or the ice tables, we're just gonna keep building on that. And if you don't feel strongly after a week off, um, you don't feel strongly about that kind of stuff, then we'll get you feeling better about that. Repetition is going to help be our friend when it comes to equilibrium because it shows up everywhere um, and in all sorts of different forms. Um, and then we'll start talking about how you can take a couple of equilibria as its own chapter, its own section in the OpenStax textbook. It's, I think it's, I just looked at this with uh, Brad Peaton, 15.3, uh, chapter 15, like chapter 13, 14, and 15 are all three of them are equilibrium, right? It was basic equilibrium, like products over reactants, followed by here's Ka and Kb and pH, and here's some weird stuff that equilibrium does. And then it's, Here's more weird stuff equilibrium does. That's what we're going to get into a little bit today as we end on Thursday. Um, so a little bit of stuff. The way the grades are, are set up is going to be a little bit different this quarter. And it's not that different because you did have a research project. Um, but here's our grade breakdown. You're going to have assignments, exams, and a research project. And to the research project part got hyped up because you talked a lot about it when you were picking your topics last quarter, right? Um, this is going to be one where you actually propose doing some research in the lab and then go out and, and I say, yeah, this seems reasonable or you're a little ambitious. Let's, let's cool it down a little bit and think about like one part of this where I'll say, ah, you, you can be a little bit more ambitious. Um, but then we'll actually get in there and you'll actually do some research and try doing running experiments and see if things behave the way you expect them to. So you're going to be pre presenting your own research, not somebody else's research um, at the at the end of the quarter. Right. So it'll be a little bit different um, set up and we're going to be working on that the whole quarter. Um, ICAs are going to be a little bit less common because we're going to take that second lab period um, in a lot of these weeks. The second lab period that we meet is going to be time for you to work on your research project, especially once we get past midterm. Um, basically, ICAs will go away at that point. And it'll be every time you come to lab, you're either doing a lab, a wet chemistry lab, or you're working with your research on your research project. Um, and that's actually all we're doing in lab on tomorrow or Thursday is we'll go through the research project and proposals in more details and have you start, you know, brainstorming some ideas. Um, and I'll have you come up with some ideas before you get into groups so that you that way if. And then you can kind of find people that are interested in similar similar phenomena, want to do a similar type of project, rather than just go with the lab groups that you're used to. Those you might not have that many shared interests when it comes to what you actually want to do for your research project. So I'm going to have you do an individual portion where you come up with some ideas, and then kind of everybody will split up into groups and see what works and, and how schedules align and stuff like that. Um, the other thing that's a little different here is instead of homeworks, um, I don't really, they're really the same thing as, as homeworks, but these quizzes um, 
are sort of my way of making you think about chemistry over the weekends. Um, there's been a lot. Um, there's been some decent neurology research that that suggests that if you are asked to recall something that you learned or a concept you learned within about three to 12 hours after the first time you learn it, it improves retention and comprehension really, really drastically. Um, and so, and also, if you have a Tuesday, Thursday lab in this class, you can go from Thursday at three until Tuesday at 9 a.m. without thinking about chemistry if you're on top of all your assignments, right? Which sounds great in theory, but that just means that I just wind up spending the first half of every lecture reteaching you the stuff that you haven't thought about for five days. So by having it set up as a quiz over the weekends, um, I'm basically am forcing you to sometime between 5 p.m. on Thursday and midnight on Sunday, you have to come back to the stuff we learned the previous week and work on it. Um, and it specifically won't be available until two hours after class ends. Because I don't want you to finish this class, walk out that door, sit down, finish it, and then not think about it. So I make you go do something else for two hours, and then you can come back to it and finish. You can still do it Thursday night if you want. That's still okay. I'm not going to please it that much. But the whole point is you have to come back to it after you've walked away and thought about other stuff, because that's the part that really helps with the retention. Benjamin, did you have a question? Okay. Um, so those in those quizzes are, I spend more time grading those on, and giving feedback on those than I do on ICAs or labs typically, um, because labs you're with me working on it most of the time, right? And so you have a chance to interact with me, ask questions, you're turning it in and it's complete, I'm gonna assume that you understand what you turned in. I'm not gonna give a ton of feedback on labs. Um, and same with the ICAs. Like uh, keys will be made available, you're working on them in groups, you're working with me. So I'm not gonna spend, if you're getting all the input and, and feedback in person and working with me on stuff, I'm not gonna spend a ton of my time on what you actually turn in on campus. And so that's um, the quizzes on the other hand, they have to be over the weekend. You can feel free to email me or work in groups and talk to people and stuff like that. But that's where I'll give you more feedback, grades. Oh, you missed this aspect here. Put all that info into the into your Canvas quizzes. Um, so that's that's why they're their own category. Yeah. But the actual quiz assignments like time once you open the assignment, no. like that, like the three days. To no, you've got that. That's why they're really more like homework assignments than they are like quizzes, really, because they're open book. You've got all weekend to work on them. The due date is just any, you can start at 5 p.m. on Thursday and leave it open all weekends and turn it in at 9 p.m. on Sunday. Um, there's no real time limit on it other than just get it done by, by Sunday, yeah. Are your assignment deadlines like one week after they're assigned or? Typically, yeah. Um, with the exception of the quizzes because that's gonna be an ongoing every week thing. Um, any other questions on? Class setup. Um, I do accept late work, so you don't need to email me to have me open up, you know, an assignment or anything like that. But you'll be able to turn anything in up till five this week, um, just like Carl had it set up. Obviously, turning it in on time is ideal, but if that doesn't work out, just get it turned in as quickly as you can. There's sort of a sliding scale for it's not like, oh, it's one minute late, it's fifty percent off. It's sort of like, okay, if you got it turned in before I got to work in the morning, the next morning, like, I don't care if it's turned in at 2 a.m. On, on Monday morning or if it's turned in at midnight on, on Sunday night. Those are the same to me since I'm not sitting at my computer grading at that point anyway, right? So it's like, it's the default is always midnight, but any time during the night is fine. Um, and typically they take off one point for every lecture late. Um, something is, and most of your assignments are going to be out of 10 points. So if it's a, if it's a week late, that's usually like, I would, you know, depending on, on the material and stuff like that, it might be like two and a half points out of 10 late. Uh, anything more than two weeks late, it's going to be five points off. 50% is the best you can do if you turn it in. So still get it turned in. Those late fees start adding up. Um, if you, if you keep turning stuff in late, um, but at the same time, it's not, not really going to crush you if you're one day late on stuff. Um, and if you do have any academic accommodations for anything like that, 
um, you know, make sure that that accommodation center sends me a, an email or talk to me about it. We'll we'll address that. Um, just come to office hours so and we'll talk it through. Um, same for exams. So there's going to be two in class tests and the take home. So there's going to be a midterm is going to be worth um, 10 percent of your grade. A final is worth 10 percent of your grade, and then a take home portion of the final it'll be worth 5% of your grade. So that adds up to 25% total in the exams category. Um, I try to pick the point values so the percentages all work nicely, but those categories are the, um, are the way to understand it with the weighted averages, basically. Not basically, it's exactly what it is. It's a weighted average. Um, I, you do get to drop your lowest quiz and your lowest assignment, whether it's a lab that you missed, um, whether it's just something you didn't turn in, you get to drop one out of each of those two categories. Um, and that's where I would caution you on that is that's automatically taken into account on Canvas. Don't expect a grade bump during finals week because it's already dropping your lowest quiz grade and your lowest uh, assignment grade, right? I, wanna, I remember when before Canvas was a thing and everything was just tracked on Excel, we always used to count on, oh, I've got a 89.5, but I but they haven't dropped the lowest assignment yet because everything was done by hand. And so you had to wait for the last week to drop your lowest assignment because everybody was, because the teacher had to go through and mark you like, oh, this is the lowest assignment for this person. Um, and so we always had a big, yeah, it's a significant grade bump during finals week. That's not the way Canvas is set up. So you're already dropping your lowest scores in these categories. So everybody should be at like 100% for the first couple of weeks, even if you don't turn anything in, because that's going to be your drops until, until um, you have more assignments plugged in there. Uh, so here are the big assignments for the research projects. And again, more info on this in, in lab tomorrow or Thursday. Um, you're going to have a proposal. You're going to do a progress report, which is going to be kind of the you turn in a couple of pages. Here's what we've been working on. Here's our, our initial results so far. Kind of just do a check in with me. And then you're going to do a poster presentation in um, at the week 11. I think we usually do it the week before finals. Um, and then the exams. We'll do midterm exam on May 16th, and then we'll do um, the final exam during finals week. It may or may not be cumulative with 103. The stuff that we do in the second half of the quarter is kind of like a hodgepodge of all sorts of stuff. Get into you know, a little bit of organic chemistry, a little bit of biochemistry concepts. Um, we'll get it so it, it doesn't necessarily build up the way that 102 does everything's building up towards equilibrium right um it's not one cohesive topic in 103 um so we'll, when we get closer to exam two we'll decide if that's going to be partially cumulative or it'll be only on stuff from the second half but um like i said when we get there we see how much material we've gotten through and how things going we'll make that decision <laughs> then all right any questions on the class Structure here. You know when the last lecture is? I believe it's that 20th of June. I believe um I think the 27th is the Thursday of finals week. And this is this class has the final on Thursday, the same time slot. Um so I believe that that's Thursday the week of week eleven. We won't have longer lecture the Tuesday before. Correct. Yes, during finals week. Yeah. yeah, we will not meet officially for lab or lecture on the Tuesday for, um, of finals week. Do you know when you're posting the take home? Um, I'll give you at least a week, usually 10 days. So probably the Tuesday of week 11, I'll, I'll have that sent out. Uh, same with practice tests. I'll give you practice tests before each of the exams a week before the exam itself. Or anything else about that? And so the way that I do the take homes too is I don't remember, I don't know what the terms were for for Carl's take home last quarter. Um, it's going to be tricky word problems like the, the you guys remember doing the black hole problem in Chem one hundred and one. 
Um, it's like stuff like that, where it requires you to do a little bit of thinking, maybe some geometry aspects, maybe not, maybe tying together a couple different chapters in making you do some thinking outside the box. That's not what's going to be on the tests at all, though. The tests are just boiled down here are the 10 most important concepts and skills that I expect you to be able to do quickly without thinking too much about it. So I'm not going to give you to go to you go back to 101 as a as an example. I'm not going to give you a tricky stoichiometry word problem. The the word pro, the stoichiometry problems for my tests in 101 are just the, I think Carl still uses my my tests. So you know we can make really complicated word problems. That's not what's going to show up on the times tests. So it's going to be here's how many moles you have to start with. Balance the reaction and predict the theoretical yield. Just like the real bare bones basic skills. Make sense? Um, and actually, the review assignment is a good example of that. The review assignment was the in class final the last time I taught this class. It's like, so not tricky word problems, other than usually, I'll put the caveat, my in class tests have one wild card section that's going to be a word problem, going to be something a little bit weird um, that make you think on your feet a little bit. So 90% of your points are going to be really, really predictable. Here's exactly what's coming, know how to practice it. And then to separate the A's from the B's on the test is going to be, can you think on your feet a little bit, do a little problem solving, tie stuff together. Um, but you can easily get 85, 89% without even touching that number 10, that wild card problem. So if your test taking is not your strong suit, you should still be able to do well in this class on the tests because really, really predictable. That's the whole point of the way that I write these tests. John, you do a practice exam? I do. And the practice test will be last year's test or 2019's test in this case. Um, it'll just be, here's what the exam was. I, don't, you know, I might tweak it a little bit, but this is the exact structure of the test so that there's no, no surprises whatsoever when it comes to the structure of the test. For 90% of the tests, the only thing changing is the compounds and the numbers, right? So there's going to be a vocab concept based question that's like, give me a five word definition of density. Give me a five word explanation of equilibrium. That's, you know, part one, and then there's part two, part three, and so on. But they're all going to be really predictable. It's the whole point of the way that I write these. The better or worse, whether or not you like taking tests. Um, if you're in this class, it's because you're going into a field where they do a lot of assessing with tests still. Now you can argue the various, the merits of using tests to establish whether or not somebody knows the material. There's a lot of arguments to say that testing is not the best way um, to figure out if people know the material, really learn the stuff. Um, regardless though, at this point, it's still the most common way of testing, of establishing whether or not you know stuff. Um, especially in the sciences. So even if you're really bad at taking tests right now, we're going to continue to work on that, get you more comfortable, get you feeling better about that because you're going to have to at some point. If you're taking this class, it's not for fun. Um, as much as I love chemistry, I understand that. I'm realistic about that. You're taking this because it's a prereq for something else. Um, and whatever that something else is, they're still going to test you on stuff. So you got to get good at taking tests, even if you don't want to, or even if you're not good at it yet. But we we'll work on that. We'll be gentle with that as best we can. Um, any other syllabus type questions? Um, everybody got the walking tour, so everybody knows where my office is now. Um, with us taking the midterm at May 16th, if we do get that part for the lab on May 1st, the way we're supposed to, we do have a shot at potentially maybe, maybe that week of midterms um, being able to get moved into the new space um, since we'll be able to have a few more days. I'm just realizing May 16th is a really convenient time to have a test because we're also moving labs that could work well. Uh, and maybe just talking to myself here, just piecing that together. Um, anyway, all right. Uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to skip these because we'll talk about research practice in more detail. Um, but just some general thoughts about the research project is most of your projects will fall into one of these categories or multiple. Either like, here, this is a cool idea. How can I make this? Like, for instance, I had a, a student 
um, who wanted to take cinnabar, which is a mineral, uh, mercury two sulfide. And he wanted to reduce the mercury two to be metallic mercury. He wanted to produce metallic mercury from a mineral sample. Um, that was an example of an experiment design. How do we do that? How do you get cinnabar dissolved? Turns out you need some really, um, it's kind of a tricky process. Um, experiment optimization is more like, oh, I found this cool procedure on a forum online somewhere. This seems like really interesting. How would we do that? Or how do we make it fit the equipment we have or the, or the situation that we have in lab? Kind of tweak things, kind of improve yields, stuff like that. Do a couple different examples. So less of a proof of concept and more like, oh, here's how we could actually tweak it and make it something more interesting or more efficient, better yield, things like that. Um, or just do a reaction study, by which I mean like do stuff like measure equilibrium constants um, for a reaction that you that you have some interest in for some reason. Measure a rate constant, look at concentrations, anything like that is going to be what we call a reaction study. Right, so those are sort of the general concepts for what, what you're going to be looking for. So you can be thinking about that um, as we go. Um, talked a little bit about quizzes and memory and retention. Do the recall stuff. It'll help. It's going to improve with all these abstract concepts. Um, you're already two-thirds of the way through the series, so this is less relevant than if we were starting in 101 right now, but still. Um, also, there's also some good research, research that shows that happy students learn better. And even if you're not happy with the way this class is going, being able to come into this classroom and leave everything outside this classroom outside is really valuable in terms of being able to retain new information. You come into this class and you're worried about something, some drama with your friend group or something like that, and you're thinking about that instead of listening to me, that's going to affect how well you understand and stuff, how well you're what you're getting out of lectures, right? So I kind of, I like to start all my lectures with icebreakers, basically, not icebreakers like make you interact with each other and, and learn each other's names. Everybody knows each other at this point. Um, basically, that quiz, those quizzes over the weekends, one or two points up on every one of those quizzes is ask me a random chemistry question. And it can be about the material. It can be about something I said that I didn't follow up on or like, well, you, you mentioned this. Can you talk more about that? Or like, is this why this happens? Stuff like that. Any questions like that or anything relevant to the material? It's kind of an anonymous way for you to ask. It's not, not truly anonymous. I don't know who asks several few questions, but you don't have to ask in front of everybody else. It's something like, I really feel like I should understand equilibrium and I really don't understand this concept that you keep talking about. That's a place for you to ask about it. And then at the beginning of every lecture, I'll do my best to answer some of those relevant questions and then one or two random questions too, um, if, especially if they're relevant to the stuff we're talking about as sort of a way of flipping that light switch. You walk into the room, we talk about random fun chemistry stuff and try to leave outside all the stuff going on outside so that then we can get as much as we can out of lectures. Plus, it's more fun for me. It makes things a little bit more interesting when I get to know your personality and what you're interested in. And I get to talk about random science stuff too, um, so that it's not the same lecture that I gave five years ago, um, which is a little bit more fun for me. So that's the whole point of the whole happy students learn better. Try and leave everything you can outside when you get in here. We're doing chemistry and we're trying to be excited about it as much as we can. Again. Again, it's just a prereq for most of you, but still um, try to do the best you can at that. And then also, uh, does everybody know what a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset means? It's, they become more con common ideas. Fixed mindset is I'm not good at something or I am good at something. Growth mindset is more I'm not good at something yet or I'm getting better at math. I'm really, really bad at computers right now turning it into just something as small as adding those little qualifiers at the end of your sentences when you, even when you're thinking in your head, really affects the way that your brain thinks about your own abilities. So, I, you know, and it's sounds cliche and like it's not, not that big a deal, but throw those yets on the end of those sentences. I really don't get equilibrium yet. Um, just it shifts the way your brain processes things and new information. Um, as silly as it seems to say something as basic as that, it does make a difference in how well you learn the material and comprehend new concepts. 
when you can keep yourself thinking in a growth mindset. Um, I'll throw memes in occasionally if I see good chemistry memes around, if they happen to be relevant. Um, I'm not going to pretend like they're always going to be the most, I don't, I don't understand memes these days. Memes have changed so much in the last 10 years. Um, but does everybody know where the term meme comes from? It actually comes from evolutionary biology. Um, a guy named Richard Dawkins came up with the concept in the 70s of if a gene is the smallest inf unit of genetic information, a meme is the small unit of, of memory, a small unit of information that's transmitted through discussion or images with captions on them. Um, so it actually comes from biology and kind of study of consciousness. Um, and that's that's what a meme is and why it sounds like that. Uh, it's because he was basing the term off of the word gene. A meme is a memory unit. A gene is a genetic unit, um, so which is always kind of fun to think of if you haven't heard that before. I'm trying to think of the name of the book that he wrote about that. <clears throat> Uh, he wrote, he's written a lot of really good evolutionary biology books. If you're interested in evolutionary biology, um, The Blind Watchmaker is a really good one. Um, but he also, his, his earliest stuff is more in the memetics. Memetics is actually the meme equivalent of genetics. It's actually something that is starting to be considered real um, science. It's the study of how information travels from one conscious individual to another conscious individual. I'm the same, just like genetics is the study of how genes travel from one, one organism to another organism. Um, anyway, and then last but not least, come to office hours. Um, form study groups. Think about chemistry a lot. The more you think about chemistry and science, the more you're going to be able to tie in different concepts from other classes, the more stuff's going to make sense, the better you're going to do on tests, and the better set up you are for your next science class, whatever that is. And then um, it occurred to me that um, some people, if you, especially if you're if you're new to higher education, you might not know what office hours are actually for. Office hours are not. I've heard people say things like, oh, I didn't come to your office hours because I thought that, that was the time that you were doing paperwork and answering emails. Um, well, yes, I'm probably doing that too. But office hours are literally designed, they're time when my, doc, my floor will be open specifically so that you can come find me and ask questions. They're not office hours, like, don't, don't bother me, I'm in office hours. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's when you're supposed to come find me and ask questions. Um, and it's just one of those things that if you're not, if you didn't grow up in, um, in a family that had gone to college before, you might not know what that is. Um, but that's what office hours are there for. That's why every instructor has office hours. Every full-time instructor has office hours because it's supposed to be time for you to come ask questions. So make use of that. I'm going to be here. My office hours are between lab and lecture on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so noon to one on Tuesdays and Thursdays or nine to 1030 on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, and by appointment, other than that, if you don't know, if you can't make those time slots, but you need to come meet with me, send me an email. We'll work out a time. Hang out after class. Um, I'm usually going to be around for a little bit after class on Tuesdays and Thursdays that you can ask questions and stuff like that too. Although that might get harder to do as little league season ramps up because I've got roped into coaching little league for the fourth year in a row now. Um, I thought when my oldest got, got out of um, the stage where I could actually coach him effectively because I didn't play baseball that much, um, that I'm like, oh, cool, I don't have to coach anymore. But then my middle child wanted to uh, wanted me wanted to get the my dad is the coach experience and so she was gonna then last year was gonna be the last year I coached but she broke her arm a week into the season so I coached a bunch of seven year olds last year that didn't even include my daughter because she was out with a broken arm so this year it's gonna be my last year coaching but that does mean things are gonna get hectic in the afternoons because their practices start early um, anyway email me. That's the point. You can't come to my regular office hours, email me, or hang around after class. All right. And then just a couple of things about me, just so you get to know me a little bit. Um, I like talking about science. 
obviously. It's why I have this job. I really like talking about all sorts of science. I talk about music a lot. If you've had me for lab, you know that we spend more time talking about music than chemistry some days. Um, I like all sorts of games. I like baseball. Um, basically, if there's something that has like an, an online fandom, people get super into something. Odds are I've been into it at some point or another. I may be out of touch um, with some of these things, but uh, if, whatever you like to geek out about, let me know about it because I probably like to geek out about something related as well. Um, so let me know. Tell me your favorite books and TV and stuff like that. Um, I just started Vikings. I know I'm late to the boat, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but uh, that one worked on Netflix now, and that's a lot of fun. Last Kingdom was a lot of fun. A lot of good stuff. Oh, Blue Eye Samurai. Blue Eye Samurai was really good. I don't watch anime much, but that one was really fun. Um, why do I like to, talking about science? Because the universe is weird, and science is how it makes sense to the universe. I really, really like this picture because it kind of captures how science works um, a lot of ways. Anybody seen this picture before? Anybody know what that's called? It's called it's space. Very good. <laughs> um, it's called the Hubble. I believe this is this version is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field view. Um, but basically, um, every one of the dots in here, other than the, there's a couple really faint stars, those ones that have the lens flare on them. Our stars, but every other dot of light in this picture is a, is a galaxy. And this is one 13 millionth of the sky. So this is how we can actually get an estimate for how many galaxies there are, is by saying, okay, well, let's, let's assume the galaxies are more or less evenly distributed in all directions. And you can count how many galaxies there are in this tiny little fraction of the sky, expand that outward. And basically we can come to the conclusion that there's to, to borrow a term from Carl saying billions and billions of galaxies, each one of which contains billions and billions of stars. That's really, really cool. We only know that because one of the administrators for the Hubble telescope, which you know was the big uh, orbital telescope before the James Webb got launched, um, didn't have time to do her own research anymore. When you become an administrator at, in academia, Usually your research gets left behind and you just wind up, you know, divvying up time for other people to do research. But she still had access to the Hubble telescope and was allotted a certain amount of time to use the Hubble telescope every day. And so for a year, she said, well, I'm just going to take pictures of this little black space that has no, has no stars in it. And we're just going to take pictures of that black space for a whole year and then add up all of those images together to get one giant long exposure time. And this is what, what they found. They weren't expecting to find anything, but because she was curious and had the ability and just said, I'm just gonna try this and then wrote up her results. We now have an idea of how many galaxies there are in the universe, which is really, really cool. And you get some even more cool, you know, you can, this image, I pulled this one off of uh, Wikipedia, but if you look up the Wikipedia page for the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, um, this image is like 90 megs. It's a huge image. You can zoom way in on it. This is just the, the dumbed down version that wound up on my slides, but you can zoom way in and see all sorts of cool stuff, the spiral galaxies and things like that. Um, I think that's really cool. So I like talking about it. And then I also think that if you go zoom in the other way, you, instead of zooming in on space, if you zoom in on a cell, you get some really cool stuff too. Um, this is a graphical representation of, of a eukaryotic cell, the yeast cell. This is the, all the biochemistry involved. Every line represents a chemical reaction. Every dot is a different chemical that's present in a, in a yeast cell. Um, and so every single one of these lines is an equilibrium reaction, except that they're all tied together. If you change something over here, if you change one's concentration over here, Le Chatelier's affects everything. All of these are tied together in one giant system, which is really, really cool. Understand, and people, if, you, if you've taken some cell bio or some microbiome, that's the Krebs cycle right there, the citric acid cycle. There's glycolysis right here. 
just fatty acid metabolism. Um, basically, people make their entire career studying like, three lines that are tied together and how they interact and how they interact with things like hormones and neurotransmitters and things like that. Um, so this is a really good example of the fact that that one, life is incredibly complex, and two, that we know a lot about it. This is a really kind of just a really cool summary of like how much human human knowledge has changed since we started understanding how biochemistry works. Basically, all of the research that goes into this was done from about 1940 forward. So this is only like the last 80 years that humanity has been able to put this together. I think that's really cool. And I think everybody is interested in stuff like nutrition at some level, right? Everybody thinks that, you know, wants to understand what they put into their body and how it affects things. You got to understand chemistry of it to really understand how something like your diet affects how you feel or your mood, things like that. Um, and I think everybody likes understanding more about the universe. So we're going to operate on the assumption that everybody wants to understand the world around them and that the world around you is really cool. And that's kind of how, the way that I like to approach finding applications and doing word problems is, yeah, the math is really obnoxious sometimes, but it's really useful for understanding how the world works, which I think is awesome. Last but not least, you don't know, has anybody heard of the movie Starship Troopers or the book Starship Troopers? The book, the movie is a fantastic satire of fascism and, and over the, I used to think it was a really, really bad movie, really, really bad adaptation of the book, but it's really just because it's satire and I was too young to understand the satire at the time when it came out. Um, the book is fascinating because it is a little bit, of, has some fascist tendencies here and there. It's very war hawkish in places. Um, it's fascinating ideas though, and it does have one of my favorite quotes. Um, about the value of hard work. If you've ever heard the term, the best things in life are free. No, best things in life are not free. The best things in life are purchased with something other than money. Best things in life are purchased with hard work, with sweat, with you know spending all of your time thinking about things. That's how you earn things that are actually really appreciated. I just give you a grade right now. Yeah, okay, if I say it. Everybody in this class has an A. Does it mean anything to you? It'd be nice to know you had an A. You done with it, right? At the same time, it doesn't really, you don't feel a sense of accomplishment, right? So I am going to ask you all to work hard in this class, put in lots of time, lots of effort, probably some tears, hopefully no blood. <laughs> um, but all of these things put together, the whole point is, if you put in the time and work, I will as well. I'm not going to ask you to put in any time that I'm not willing to put in grading stuff. Um, you will get something that's really valuable at the end, which is an understanding of chemistry and how the world works that you didn't have before. And so I'm not just making up deadlines or making up assignments for my own health. Um, if I'm asking you to turn something in, I have to grade it, which means I'm creating more work for myself as well when I ask you to do assignments as well. So if I'm asking you to do an assignment, it's not to jump through hoops, it's because I want you to try and understand these concepts, and I'm going to be right there with you with that. All right. All right. That's so the stay in a nutshell. It wasn't all that different than what I usually do in 101, just everybody has some more shared language for right now. Um, and if you're into classic sci fi, ask me about Robert Heinlein sometimes because he's a fascinating person. Um, in general, a lot of that era. He is a contemporary of Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. Um, and it's, it was a really fascinating political climate that they were writing some of these really subversive stuff in. Um, obviously, I don't mind talking about it. So if you're interested in that, ask me about it. Otherwise, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to come back and start talking about stuff from 102 and doing some review of equilibrium in 10 minutes. Come back in two. Right. Uh, 
So the problem with what you do is we just do not put in a great so there's there's certainly maybe you can find something for you to do, maybe even just that you know be another another person that agrees to do the bounce ideas off of okay, right. like off theirs. Um but in general the, the lab portion and the lecture portion is some part of well it's not outside it's tied yeah. together. It's just like you were so if I just go to your lab class. Like last um, quarter, just um, <laughs> well, next really have research projects and that at the end to still, but you can still sit in and watch them and think about it. I've heard them say, well, I'm not pretty, but then I heard them say, there's like a it's nice to there. Kind of what the research is in the field right now. So, that's right. Um, yeah, that little like, and they have all the docs right there. Uh, yeah, but that's not that's not talking. Well, I mean, there's a couple of right, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'd be happy to. to Argue about that, and that actually would be, you know, if you wanted to do, if you wanted to do a research project, you could certainly do something like presenting some of the stuff, the current research and the, the program that you're looking in, into, um, or what is that you, because you've been working in our field, like you could do something, you know, you didn't do the research this quarter, but you were. I saw you do last I saw you in the help you understand places or something like that. Um, you know, that you do something like that too. So you can still get the experience of getting the do a presentation. That's not something you have to require in your in your situation. Yeah. Friends. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, it must have been. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I can just that, like, last time you had transmission. Yeah, like when I was in training grad school, I was in a PhD program and I left with that. I took a sheet so I get a point. Also, okay. Like, like, okay, well, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to this route. It may be like, so I don't know how it's that. I was like, you go in there. So, I don't know. So, I don't know. 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 I looked at this program too. Whatever. Um, yeah, there was always a good the break. Yeah. I get no problem. Nice to meet you. Yeah, that's what she would have said. I brought it this time. I was like, I think I did something wrong. That was all bad. So I don't yeah. Money. So yeah. If you go there, one down, it's like transmission solid because like when you go to the other, it's like it's something clutch. I took it. Right. Uh, uh, I was like, I was like, I was all it was, they were playing small touch, and I didn't, you know, right. uh, yeah. there's problems with yeah. spongy, yeah. Like, yeah. which affects the shift in the tube. So, uh, yeah. Right, let's start talking about some review stuff. <laughs>
Who remembers three definitions of an acid? Even if you don't remember what they were, does anybody remember what the names were or the definitions? Low pH. Ron said Lowry. It was low pH. Low pH means something acidic. That's what we call the Arrhenius definition. I always forget how to spell his name. Arrhenius definition just means that something's an acid. If you add it to water, the pH goes down. Or in other words, if you add it to water, concentration of hydronium increases. That's That was one of the first definitions of what a base was. Before we even knew anything about covalent compounds with much certainty or being able to do Lewis dot structures, um, Svante Arrhenius was, I believe he's Swedish, but he might have been Norwegian. Um, incidentally, so this is the late 1800s, um, Svante Arrhenius is also the first person to publish peer-reviewed research showing that climate change was, that anthropogenic climate change was a thing. Um, he, this is basically closer to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution than it is to today. This is 120 years, 140 years ago, in the 1880s. Svante Arrhenius started crunching numbers in looking at CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and realizing based on how much coal the Industrial Revolution was burning, that we were going to noticeably change the global concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that that could have greenhouse effect on the planet. Um, of course, him being Swedish, Norwegian, he thought that global warming, Swedish, thank you, um, might be a positive thing for humanity because he was looking at too isolated of a system. He was just looking at, oh, temperature's going up. That's going to mean more, more of the planet is actually available for agriculture. That's going to help humanity. It's going to lead to milder winters and stuff like that because he wasn't taking into account things like um, ocean sea level rise and extreme weather events because that was a more complicated system that he had access to. But his, his predictions for global, for global temperature change still match really closely what we've observed in the last hundred years. Um, and so when, you know, it's, it's less of an issue recently when I first started teaching, there was still a lot of climate change denial, denialism happening. Um, like, this is not new science. Svante Arrhenius, we have, he's been in textbooks for 60 years at least, talking about definitions of acids. And he's also the one who did all the research, initial research on climate change um, back in the 1880s. Um, the other definition I heard, somebody said Bronsted Lowry. Or Scandinavians. I think, I think Bronsted was Danish. Um, Ron, what's the Bronsted Lowry definition of an acid? Anybody remember? Proton donor. Proton donor. It has a proton that it can give up. And then what's the last definition? Anybody remember? Actually said, said the scientist's name when I was talking about Arrhenius. The Lewis definition. It's the same Lewis as a Lewis dot structure. It's like the electron definition. That's the electronic definition. And it's basically proton donor. If you flip the charge on proton, you get an electron, right? But then you got to flip this, flip this as well. So as the way I remember it is, you remember proton donor, the Lewis definition is electron acceptor. Also, side historical side note about Lewis, one of the most infamous um, Nobel Prize snubs in history, he was nominated for Nobel Prize uh, 43 times and was never voted in. There must have been some controversy there that uh, there's not a whole lot of record of. Um, but I mean, how else do you justify not giving the guy who invented Lewis dot structures a Nobel Prize in chemistry? Um, other than, especially when they've been they've nominated 43 times. Um, but then once he died, then that was all over because they don't do posthumous Nobel Prizes, um, which is why Rosalind Franklin is still not given a make up Nobel Prize for her work with on the double helix structure of DNA um, because she died before Watson and Crick got Nobel Prize. So she couldn't be included, even if they had included her in and in acknowledged her research. 
Um, she just died too quickly. All right, so by and large, these are the two that matter the most, right? We can talk about Lewis acids and Lewis bases a little bit when we start talking about things, but it's basically so a Lewis acid or Lewis base will still also be an Arrhenius acid or base, but it might not have a proton that it can donate. So if you take like metal ion, take an um, iron three ion and dissolve it in water, it makes the water more acidic. It makes the solution more acidic, even though iron doesn't have a proton it can give. And so that's why it gets its own definition. So, well, it can't be a proton donor, but it's definitely acidic. So we need some other way to understand that. That's where this definition comes in. But by and large, that's the one that matters the most. That's the one we're going to use more than anything else. It's a proton donor, proton acceptor. So in this reaction above, we put hydroxide with hydrogen carbonate. And they react to make carbonate and water. What's the what's the uh, bronsted Lowry acid and what's the base? Bicarbonate's the acid, which means the hydroxide's got to be the base. And who remembers the definition of conjugate acid and conjugate base? You give away a hydrogen. And it becomes a conjugate base. Good. And then the one that accepts the hydrogen is the conjugate acid. Good. The other way that you can think about it too is so that the acid turns into the conjugate just means paired, right? So the molecule, the acid after it's lost its H plus is the conjugate base. The other way that I like to think about it is the conjugate acid and the conjugate base, if the reaction happened backward. What would be the acid? Well, if the reaction happened back backward, it'd be water giving up that proton to become hydroxide. So that makes it the conjugate acid because it's it's the base that's already gained the proton. So if it went backwards, this would be giving up a proton. And so you can think of the conjugate acid conjugate bases. If it went backwards, what would what would be happening? Um. Who remembers the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants, good. What's the second rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants. Always products over reactants. Um, so what is the expression? When I say what's the expression for KC, I don't mean what's a numerical value. I mean, what's, what's the ratio? And H2O over... Well, or not H2O so because it's a liquid. That's the third rule of equilibrium, right? Solids and liquids don't count. Technically, anything with a constant concentration doesn't count. It can matter, this water can matter as far as stoichiometry goes, as limiting reactant goes, but it can't change anything as far as K because it's got a constant concentration. So solids and liquids don't count. So just be carbonate. Then our concentrations on that side, right? So hydrogen carbonate and hydroxide. All right, so that's all pretty pretty good. I think everybody had pretty good recall about these first three points, right? Who knows how to answer this question? You know, PKB for carbon. What's the value of the equilibrium constant for the reaction? Say it again. Negative log. So we take negative log of that, except that that's, that's for a specific to the negative three point seven six. Good. That gets us. That's our equilibrium constant for carbonate reacting with water, though, right? Mm -hmm. KB. So KA is always a weak acid plus water makes hydronium and the conjugate base, right? For KB, it's always a weak base plus water makes the conjugate acid. I don't need the bracket there.
and is to be a conjugate base. We don't, we have this value. So PKB specifically should be an uppercase B is 3.76. Like some, some are saying to get KB for carbonate, that's gonna be 10, the negative 3.76. So we can get a value for that. That's not the reaction that we had written, is it? What happened with the reaction we had written? It was the inverse, right? We flipped products in the reactants, didn't we? Well, what's the first rule of equilibrium? So what happens if we flip the products in the reactants? What happens to K? Positive. Close. It's the reciprocal. So instead of just saying if KB is 10 to the ninth minus 3.76, that negative flips. But I'm not going to write it that way. So the reaction here would be one over. So all we did is we flipped our products and reactants, which means we flipped the top and bottom of that ratio, right? You flip the top and bottom of that ratio, we get one over. Does that remind you of anything else with any other reactions where if you flip the products and reactants, we flip the negative sign? What was it that did that? We had something like, negative 176 kilojoules per mole. What's delta H for C turns into A plus B? Positive 176, right? You flip products and reactants, our energy split sides. It's not quite the same for equilibrium constants because equilibrium, the energies in equilibrium constants flip a little bit differently. Does everybody remember your thermodynamics when it comes to delta G? Does everybody remember the equation for how delta G and K are related? Does that ring any bells or did we not get to that yet? Maybe. What is the E to the negative delta G over RT? So if you flip products and reactants, and this expression is e to the negative delta g over rt. Don't worry, I don't expect you to come up with this on your own right now, but I'm just explaining why it's one over and not just flip a negative sign. It's because when we flip the products and reactants, the sign on delta g changed, went from positive to negative, right? Which means you've got e to a power, and the power flipped from positive to negative. Which what happens if we have ten to the ten to the ten, and then we flip the sign on or or uh, ten? We'll use nine. We did one over ten to the nine. What does that do to the the power on the nine? It's a negative. So when you flip the sign in an exponent, the fact that it's in an exponent means we've got to think like, I always kind of divvy up arithmetic in my head into like tiers. There's addition and subtraction and the next tier is multiplication and division, right? Then the next tier is exponents. When you've got something in an exponent, you have to go one tier beyond. You just flip the plus and the minus here, but that the result on K is that it's one over instead of just adding a negative sign. You can't have a negative sign on a K value, right? Because E to any value is gonna be a positive number. That's just how exponents work, right? But 
we flip the sign here, we get one over what our value was. So part of why this is valuable to think about is one, well, maybe even though we have, maybe we have hydrogen carbonate and hydroxide, we're not starting with carbonate, but we only have KB values in our tables, right? We don't have K for this reaction. We have K for the reverse reaction. So basically understanding how that works allows those tables to be even more valuable. Because now it doesn't matter if we have the forward reaction or the backward reaction. As long as we have K for one version of it, we can get K for the opposite direction, right? And it also is going to allow us to start adding reactions together, like we did with the Hess's law back when we did energies, right? We had reaction one that had a delta H value and reaction two that had a delta H value. We added them up. We cancel out things that showed up on the product and the reactants. We also just added up their delta H values, right? Does that sound familiar? We're gonna do the same thing with equilibrium constants now. So we don't just add them or subtract them, we're gonna multiply them. One tier higher in terms of where they get. Um, how well, do, how do we feel about Le Chatelier's principle? How strong are we on these concepts? Stuff like there's more entropy or less entropy. So let's go through these multiple choice tests. Basically, the nice thing about the Chatelier is there's only three options, right? You change something about a system in equilibrium, one of three things happens. You make more reactants, you make more products, or nothing happens. So even though, even if it's not written, as a multiple choice question, it, it is a multiple choice question. There's only three possibilities. And so for this reaction, if we have a system in equilibrium and then we remove, it says carbon dioxide, but then it just says CO. So but let's just say it removes carbon dioxide. Are we going to shift equilibrium to the right, the left, or no change? To the right. We're at equilibrium. We took away something on the product side, and then all of a sudden the product side of our equilibrium constant is too small, right? To get back to the right ratio, we need to take some of the reactants and turn it into product to get back to being at equilibrium. So CO2 is removed. That's going to make more products. What about if you remove the solid coal? No change, right? Solids don't show up in our equilibrium expression. So changing the amount of CO of coal that you have doesn't change anything, right? What about temperatures increased? Is that gonna change anything? Why? Because it's exothermic. It's exothermic. So in terms of the chat, this isn't exactly how it works in, in terms of mathematically. But conceptually, the way we can think about it is if it's exothermic, we're making heat as a product. If we're making heat as a product, if temperature is increased, we're adding heat. We're adding a product, it's going to shift towards the reactants. Really, the way that that affects things is because K actually changes because. There was this term, right? If T goes up, it changes delta G and it changes T here. So when you change the temperature, you actually change the equilibrium constant. But conceptually, if we're just looking at it in terms of which way is it going, not an amount, all you have to do is think about it like this. Is heat a reactant or a product? If it's endothermic, then heat is a reactant and adding, increasing the temperature shifts equilibrium that way. All right, volume is decreased. Why? Because that's less moles of gas. Yeah, so we in, if we decrease the volume, that means we increased the pressure, right? We 
increase the pressure. Le Chatelier says we're trying to undo whatever change we make, right? So if the pressure goes up because we decrease the volume, the system is going to react in a way that takes the side with more gas molecules and moves towards the side with less gas molecules. So by decreasing the, the volume, we're going to make more product. Right? And again, the math is a little bit more tricky than that, because really what is happening here, if we think about if we think about it into KP, we had pressure of CO2 and pressure of CO squared. You decrease the volume, the pressure of both sides goes up, right? But because there's a squared term here, it goes up more on the bottom than it does on the top, which means your reactant side is too big all of a sudden. It's no longer at equilibrium when you do that because the bottom, the denominator is too large. The denominator is too large. It tries to get back to equilibrium by making the numerator bigger and the denominator smaller. And so conceptually you can think about it as if the volumes, if the pressure is increased, then you're gonna to move to the side with fewer gas molecules, but here's the map for why. It's because of those exponents. They're not all changing by the same amount. Yeah, well, they're all changing. Both, both sides of the fraction aren't changing by the same amount. If every pressure is changing by the same amount. But the fact that there's that squared term is what throws it off. And then last but not least, we add a catalyst. What does the catalyst do? You guys talk about catalysts at all? Reaction. Makes the reaction get there faster, but it doesn't change the energy of the products and the reactants. So if you don't change the energy of the products and the reactants, then delta G, delta G does not change. Delta G doesn't change. K doesn't change. K doesn't change. The reaction's all still at equilibrium. I tie a lot of things back to this equation for a lot of reasons, partly because when I was in grad school, my research was in computational chemistry and we did things like calculating delta G mathematically rather than measuring delta G or using delta H formation values. So I always think about K and rate constants in terms of this form of the equation because that's just what my background is. Um, but it does make a lot of these conceptual things make more sense you're math minded and you don't like the generalizations as it's just trying to undo stuff. It's not really trying to undo stuff. The math is just kind of complicated. And when you make a change here, it's going to tweak numbers and concentrations to get back to that same ratio or get back to the forward reaction and backward reaction at the same rate. All right, is that a valuable review? Makes a lot of sense. Maybe you made some extra connections now that you've taken some time and um, let things process over break. Um, all right, here's another conceptual one. Hydrogen carbonate is, does anybody remember what the term was for an acid or a base? Amphoteric, very good. Amphi meaning two, teric. I don't know where Tarek comes from. I like to break down things into their root words a lot. I don't know where Tarek's root word is, but ampho means two, both directions, like amphiphilic in terms of something that interacts with water and hydrophilic, hydrophobic substances. Um, is hydrogen carbonate a better acid or a base? And why? Just going off the numbers, and KB is smaller. Or I mean, larger. KB is larger, which means products over reactants, product side is larger in KB than it is in KA. And for the same concentration on the reactant side, you will make more product if K is larger, right? So that means that on average, even though hydrogen carbonate can be an acid or a base, 
it's more likely to act if if it can be an acid or a base, it's more likely to act as a base because KB is larger. Does that mean it's going to exclusively be a base when you put it in water? That means on average, if you looked at, at the entire collection of hydrogen carbonate molecules, more of them will be in the deprotonated state than in the protonated state. Um, more of them will be in the conjugate acid, conjugate base form than in the conjugate acid form. There's something else about that I was going to say. Oh, so I, I'm going to always keep coming back to um, the movie Interstellar has one of my favorite explanations of how chemistry works of all time, which is weird because they don't talk about chemistry much in that movie. Um, it's all astrophysics and stuff like that. But does anybody remember the definition of Murphy's Law that they use in the movie? They say it a few different times. Anything that can happen does happen. That's actually the purest form of Murphy's Law. It's not anything that can go wrong does go wrong. Anything that can happen does happen. Hydrogen carbonate can be an acid and it can be a base. It's a better base, but that doesn't mean it stops being an acid. All of those tiny hydrogen carbonate molecules floating around in solution are doing their own thing. On average, more of them will act as a base than an acid, but there's still a few of them acting as an acid at any given point. And so when, anytime um, we're talking about equilibrium, I'm going to keep coming back to that concept. And I'll keep saying that anything that can happen does happen. Just because K is really, really small doesn't mean it's zero. It does happen. But as these numbers are getting bigger or smaller and smaller and smaller, as these exponents get bigger and bigger and bigger, we can get closer and closer to saying things happen. Absolutely. Like, but in general, if we really want to split hairs and if we had enough ways, enough sig figs on the way we're measuring things, you can always say that there's some amount of product left over or some amount of reactant being made because there's anything that can happen does it in really small amounts sometimes. Let's see. Do you guys go over what to do if you have a weak acid and a weak base? So if we have hydrogen carbonate as a weak base added to a weak acid, a reaction can happen. What would that reaction look like if acetic acid reacts with hydrogen carbonate? Isn't the strongest acid the one that has each other? Um, if you have two weak acids, yes, but in this case, we have a weak acid and a weak base. Uh, okay. Do a little stoichiometric table. Well, so we're, we're going to do that, but first we need, because really, what's, what's the reaction that's happening here? We've got acetic acid and hydrogen carbonate. If acetic acid acts as the, as the acid, and hydrogen carbonate acts as a base, what do we get for our products? Sorry, I should probably write that out. You guys use that, that abbreviation for acetate last quarter at all? Okay. So, full form, there's acetic acid, right? That's you. The ochem instructor and the organic chemists like to make make up abbreviations that look like chemical symbols that aren't really like ME for a methyl group and things like that. Um, what do we get as our? We've got a weak acid. This is, is amphoteric, but it's a better base than an acid. And if we're putting it with a weak acid, we're going to assume this acts as the base. So what do we get for a product? We need to no. H3O. That would be if it was reacting with water, if oh. water was the base. Oh. CO3 minus? CO3. That would be if hydrogen carbonate was acting as the acid. Okay, so H3O. H plus H. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. 
this way between the AC sometimes. C2H3O2 minus. How do we get the equilibrium constant for this reaction? That's not what we have. We have the equilibrium constants for carbonic acid with water. We have the equilibrium constant for acetic acid with water. If we want to know what the equilibrium constant is for both of them together, we're going to have to multiply. We're going to have to adjust these. So the way we do this, if we have two different Ka values and we want to find K for a combined reaction, this is what's called a coupled equilibrium. This is what that term is. We have two equilibrium reactions happening that we have K values for. If we want to find the K value for the combined reaction, we're just going to manipulate those, spin them around, cancel stuff out like we used to with Hess's law. We just have to do the same thing with the equilibrium constants, just like we would with the delta H value from back in chapter 13. Well, so what's now let's talk about acetic acid in water because we've got K for this equation, right? We had pKa. So to get Ka, we just do 10 to the negative power of pKa, right? Um, I happen to remember this one off the top of my head. You take that Ka value from the other slide. Um, I do 10 to the negative of that pKa value. You should get this within sig figs. Then we have carbonic acid. What do the products look like for the Ka reaction here for carbonic acid? H3O. And HCO3 minus one. Good. We want to add these two react, and we have a Ka value for it. I'm not going to clear the uh, whiteboard and go back to the other slide because then it'll erase everything here. Does anybody have that value written down? Or what was pKa uh, for carbonic acid? 3.6. 3.6? For pKa? Yeah. So pKa is 3.6. So Ka is 10 to the negative 3.6. You can simplify that right in scientific notation if you want, but I don't have a calculator up here, so I'm just going to leave it like that for now. So we want to take these two reactions, because these are the two reactions that we know the Ka values for. We want to manipulate them so that when we add them together, they look like that combined reaction that I wrote on the other slide. In other words, we don't want water or H3O plus to show up. We want hydrogen carbonate to be a reactant and carbonic acid to be a product, right? So, you flip it. so we flip it. If we rewrite this, Switch products and reactants. It's an equilibrium reaction, right? All we did was switch products and reactants. It's already happening in both directions. But now we can say H2CO3 and then water. And what happens to K? It's no longer Ka if we do that, right? It's Ka specifically was for the forward reaction. It's one over Ka though, right? Or Flip the sign there. 
because one over is going to flip the sign on the exponent there. Or you can also write it as for the reaction written in black, K is one over KA. So now what happens, what does our reaction look like if we take this reaction and that reaction and add them together? One written in black and the one written at the top. Is anything gonna cancel out? Yeah, what cancels out? Water. water. That water is product and water as a reactant. And then H3O. Hydronium. As a reactant, hydronium is a product. And we're left with acetic acid and hydrogen carbonate as reactants, which is what we wanted, right? And on the product side, we get carbonic acid and acetate are left over. So if we added the two, the products plus the products and the reactants plus the reactants, what are we gonna have to do to the K values? Close. The K expression then looks like this, the combined K expression. Then we okay if I clear this? For the combined reaction, it, K is gonna look like concentration of hydronium over a concentration of hydronium because it was a product and a reactant, right? Water doesn't show up in here, so we leave it off. We had carbonic acid over HCO3 minus. Then we had deprotonated form, so acetate. T2H3O2 minus one, just enough room. And the protonated form. Why did I bother writing this back out again? So that we can see that what happens when we add these two reactions together, we, we added something to the reactant side and to the product side, right? Which means we added another term to the top of K and to the bottom of K. Sure, they're going to cancel out, but the result is we wind up multiplying the K values together because we added stuff to the top and to the bottom. That's like multiplying by a fraction, right? We multiply it by a fraction, which means our K values are going to multiply together. So our combined K value. I'm just gonna I don't practice on this board. I haven't used this board a bit. The K for the combined reaction is going to be KA for the acetic acid times one over KA for the carbonic acid. Because when we add the two reactions together, the K values get multiplied. For the same reason that if you flip products and reactants, you get one over the K value. Mathematically, that's the same thing that's happening. Which means we can actually get a value for it, right? 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 is K for acetic acid over 10 to the minus 3.76. You can plug that into your calculators and get a number, right? So what do we get for K for the combined reaction? Get something like one over 10, something about 0.1. Yeah, I got 0 0.0700. So this is why we can't just look at the Ka value for the for one of the acids. 
because if you have a weak acid and a weak base together, they're reacting in a way that changes the K value. We can't just ignore the weak base part of it. And this is a buffer. Huh? Right, this is a more complicated buffer than normal because we have two weak acid, weak base things happening. So then how the heck do we figure out what the pH is going to be. We didn't, our combined reaction didn't have a hydronium concentration in it anymore though, right? And this is gonna be where we treat it like a buffer because we don't need to know exactly what H3O plus concentration is as long as we know what our concentration of acetate and acetic acid are relative to each other because then we can plug it into our Henderson Hasselbalch equation. That looks familiar, right? So we're going to do an ice table with this K value for our combined reaction to get what those ratios are. Once we know what A minus and HA are, though, we just plug it in here to get pH. All right, I'm going to clear this and then we'll write it out. So, K okay, for the combined reaction, 0 0.070. The combined reaction is Once again, always, every time, I have a space over it. I'm to get too close to the buttons. It doesn't like, let me write too close to the buttons. Well, we've got K and we've got an equilibrium reaction. So we're just going to do an ice table now. Should be pretty comfortable with ice tables, hopefully, at this point. You might not have known how to get here, but now that we're here, this should feel pretty familiar, right? Start with initial concentrations of everything, write a minus X and a minus X and a plus X and a plus X, solve for X. See what I mean? Too close to the edge of the slide. What's our initial concentration here for everything? Well, start with acetic acid since that one's easy. Yeah, it's given to us, right? How do we find our initial concentration of hydrogen carbonate? Converge moles. Yeah, we have to do a molecular weight constant um, calculation with the 25 grams here, mm -hmm. and then use the 475 milliliters in liters, but we can get to molarity there. That's not too tricky, right? What do we say for our starting concentration of our products? Just assume it's really close to zero, right? So we're just going to make it zero. Notation wise, when I'm writing zero and I want to make sure it's not confused with an oxygen or something like that, I'll always put the, the hash mark through it. Um, it's not some funky Greek letter, that's just a zero. Okay? I don't want you to think it's, it's an oxygen. What's our change going to be for everything? Any weird stoichiometry going on here? Everything's all one to one, right? So minus x's and plus x's. We don't know what that is yet, but once we crunch the numbers, there'll be a number there. But whatever it is, it's just going to be minus x. X. So we're just going to get an equilibrium expression, plug it in, solve for x. K being so large, I mean relatively large, we're probably not going to be able to do the whole assume x is zero trick because x might actually be a significant fraction of this initial concentration, right? So, and with k being this large, 
we'll actually have to use a solver or plug it into a quadratic equation to solve for it. But it's just math at that point, right? Plug and chug. And I'm not sure Carl's stance on this whole thing. In this, when I'm grading stuff, especially homework, open book stuff, if you're, I plugged it into Wolfram Alpha is a valid mathematical step when it comes to showing your work. The mathematicians don't like me to say that, but this isn't the class on algebra and how to use the quadratic equation. So getting it to the point where you set up your equation, where you've done your substitution and you have your X is all, I, all I'm looking for. Then you can say, I plugged it into a solver, X is equal to this. Anybody run the numbers for hydrogen carbonate concentration yet? 0.627. Right, so add, add equilibrium 0 0.627 minus x, 0 0.839 minus x, x, x. So plug everything in, products of reactants. X times X over 0.839 minus X times 0.627 minus X. Like I said, you can boil the bottom, multiply both sides by the results, put all the X, put it in a quadratic form, plug it into Jeez, can I even remember it off the top of my head? Negative B plus or minus the square root of four AC minus C squared. You spoke B squared. All of that over two A. That's close, considering I haven't actually typed anything into that in a really long time. Or have over Once we get to there, if you want us to isolate No, you don't need to do that. Even just take it like that. And plug it in more from alpha. I keep saying that, so I should probably. What? So you have a buffer? Point five minus It's a good thing we didn't assume X was close to zero, right? Because X is actually a substantial portion of both of these numbers. It's definitely more than 5%, so we wouldn't have been able to make that assumption anyway. When I say things like just type it into a solver, is that worth taking the time to look at? I say we're, at, we're out of time for today. So we'll start with how to flex that visual solver on Thursday, just to make sure we're all on the same page there. And we'll start getting into more, more types of reactions, more types of equilibrium.